Good evening and welcome to our midweek gathering. That sounds loud to me. Is that loud? As loud as it sounds to me? Sound okay in the back? Too loud in the front? Okay. We'll go with that. Uh, good evening and welcome to our midweek gathering for Wednesday, August 25th. My apologies that we're beginning a, a little late this evening. We're without Guy tonight. And so Paul received a crash course in running our, our camera back there. And we're just trying to get organized with the different things that Guy usually takes care of. So uh, his treatment today took quite a toll on him, was a lot. This was supposed to be the short day, and when he let me know what time he'd begun, when he'd gotten home, it was anything but short. So please continue to keep Guy in your prayers. The announcements that I'm aware of, first of all, would be our uh, church picnic at Buell Park. That's this coming Saturday, August 28th. That will be at 5 o'clock, and that is in Shelter 4. So please plan to be there and encourage others to join us for that time of fellowship. Our next singing evening will be this coming Sunday, August 29th at 6 p.m. So please come ready with any song requests that you have. We've been working on the system here so that we can accommodate any requests and in just a matter of moments... I won't even say minutes, should be less than a minute, but in a matter of moments, we should be able to pull that request uh, up onto the screen. So there's one last piece of technology we need for that should arrive tomorrow and we'll be ready for Sunday. And the only other, other announcement that I have is that following class uh, this evening, uh, before we leave the building after our dismissal prayer, I will uh, copy the worship schedule for the month of September. So any who are involved in public worship service in any way in the coming month in September, please be sure to pick one up as you leave the building tonight. Lord, speak to me that I may speak in living echoes of thy tone as thou hast sought so let me see thine erring children lost and alone O oh, strengthen me that while I stand firm on the rock and strong in thee, I may stretch out a Thy love to tell Thy 
thy praise to show. Father, as we continue our prayer together tonight, we pray that we would show your great love to those in this world around us. Father, there are many that are on, on our hearts at this time. There are many that we are concerned about, that we have been and will continue to be lifting up before you. In times like this, as we unite in this prayer, but at all times through the day, as we go along the way, as we lie down, as we get up, as we gather around a table, as, as we go through every part of our day, there are those that are in the forefront of our minds and the, the struggles they're going through weigh heavily upon our hearts. And Father, you know that our brother Guy is at the, the front of that list and we know that this chemotherapy from everything that he shared on Sunday past as he's begun into this phase of his treatment has been very, very difficult. More so than probably any of us had anticipated. More so than he expected. And knowing that this was to be the shorter day and, and yet it has resulted in him being so exhausted from the treatment that he's unable to be with us. It's so unusual not to have him here. We pray that you would bless him right at this moment as we pray for him. That you would lay your hand upon him and help him recover. That you would ease the pain that he's in. That you would help him to feel better as he rests. And pray for a good night of rest for him that as he awakes tomorrow he'll feel some improvement we continue to ask that you would heal him and bring about a complete recovery for him and for us. Father, we pray for the treatments that he's undergoing that even as they are exhausting him and taxing his body and weighing heavily upon him, that they would be effective. We pray that they will reduce and eradicate this cancer from his body. Pray for continued guidance for those that are caring for him in the medical field. We pray that you would ensure that the, the steps that they take would be the right ones. And we pray that you'd work through them, through these treatments, and even above and beyond these things, to reduce the pain that Guy is experiencing and to bring about healing. Pray your blessings upon him and his family at this time. We continue in our prayers for Amy, who is now undergoing treatments for cancer also, as she and her husband Scott and her brother Alan and their whole family go through this difficult time we pray that you would bear them up, that you would strengthen them and carry them through. And we again pray for the success of those treatments that Amy's undergoing, that they will heal her of this cancer. Father, we also are mindful at this time of Flo as she's back there in the Cleveland Clinic with the difficulties with her heart that she had been having that, that caused them to get her up there very, very quickly. And now they are monitoring her and, and awaiting the right time to carry out the procedure whereby she will have a pacemaker and we pray that again you give those doctors wisdom that you would guide them and that you would guide the hands carrying out that operation and pray that it would help our sister and that you would heal her and help her in her recovery just as we ask that you be with her husband Chuck 
and be with their family as Lucinda cares for them and, and will be up there and, and, and perhaps even coming back and forth. We pray you watch over each one in their family. Father, at this time we continue to pray for Chuck and for uh, Mary, for those who are not able to be here with us as often as they would like. And we pray that when they are, that we can do all that we can to be an encouragement to them. And we're so thankful for their presence here in these past weeks. And we pray that just as we are encouraged by seeing them, that we can come alongside of them once more and, and do all that we can do and say to lift their spirits. We pray also at this time for uh, Carl and, and his health and ask that you continue to bless him as uh, those cracks continue to heal and pray that, that he'll be able to move forward with less and less discomfort and more and more easily. Pray for Mark as he continues in healing from the hip replacement surgery and ask that that would continue to heal well and properly in the time frame or even quicker than the time frame that they anticipate. Pray also for Adam and for, for Les, those that are experiencing difficulties with their health. And we're thankful for their continued presence here with us. The example that they have set for a very long time and the example of their marriages. And we pray your blessings upon Adam and Joanne and upon Les and Jerry. Father, we continue in our prayers for Mark and Heather and their family as they try to help Marcia, who has suffered such a serious fall and has continued to have difficulties and setbacks. And we pray that you would be with them as they work out what the next steps are and what's going to be the best thing to do to provide the care that Marcia is going to be needing. We pray you give Mark and Heather and Mark's sisters wisdom as they discuss those things and, and light a path for them in this decision-making process. Father, we lift up before you at this time, just as we have been uh, from Sunday onwards, our brother Chuck and sister Kathy, uh, and pray for their family. Uh, we're thankful for uh, their presence here, for Kathy's recovery from her knee replacement, the progress that she has made, and we continue to pray your abundant Blessings upon them and upon their family. Grant them uh, peace and bless them to be able to continue to be growing uh, spiritually here among us and to continue to be encouragers uh, of, of those around them. And we pray your blessing upon them and upon their family uh, at this time and throughout this week. Father, we know that there are many that we are missing and have been for some time, and we continue to try to remind ourselves that these spiritual concerns are of such greater consequence to you than, than these physical cares and worries that, that often weigh heavily on our minds. Help us to be as concerned, and more so, about brothers and sisters who have been here, but who have fallen along the way, who have turn back and, Father, touch their hearts and reach out to them through any of us that we might see them restored and return to this fellowship. Father, we pray for those who are part of this family, not only here tonight, but those still at home listening to the, the videos midweek and Sunday and those who will be here again this Sunday who are not with us tonight. We pray for each one, every individual and family among us that we might be continuing to grow in our faith. And we thank you for opportunities like this one to be fed through your word, to be strengthened and encouraged by it and in our fellowship, and to be able to speak to you in this way through Jesus, and to be able to bring requests before you and know that you hear us, and that you care, and that you love us, and that we have this opportunity to, to lift our voices and our hearts together in praise. It's such a joy to us to be able to do all of these things in fellowship with one another. And we pray that the joy of being your children 
will fill our hearts and flow out of our lives and over into the lives of those around us in such a way that others would be added to your church, that others will come to be saved by seeing Christ in us and hearing about him from us. And Father, we pray you'd bless us with that growth, both spiritual and relational within your family and numerical, as we know you desire to see us grow far more than any one of us. Father, thank you for your love for us and for hearing our prayer at this time. We love you and we pray this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you be poured out like wine upon the altar for me? Would you be broken like bread to feed the hungry? Would you be so one with me that you would do just as I will? Would you be light and life and love my word fulfilled? Yes, I'll be poured out like wine upon the altar for you. Yes, I'll be broken like bread to feed the hungry. Yes, I'll be so one with you that I will do just as you will. Yes, I'll be light and life and love your word fulfilled. Would you be poured out like wine upon the altar for me? Would you be broken like bread to feed the hungry? Would you be so one with me that you would do just as I will? Would you be light and life and love my word fulfilled? <clears throat> to be like Jesus, to be like Jesus, all I ask. To be like Him all through life's journey, from earth to glory, all I ask to be like Him. To be like Jesus, to be like Jesus, how I long to be like Him. So meek and lowly, so pure and holy, how I long to be like Him. To be like Jesus, to be like Jesus, all I ask to be like Him. All through life's journey, from earth to glory, all I ask to be like Him. John chapter 1 and verses 15 through 18. John 1, 15 through 18. John testifies concerning him. He cries out saying, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. From the fullness of his grace... We have all received one blessing after another. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. 
No one has ever seen God, but God, the one and only, who is at the Father's side, has made Him known. The last time we noted that John, the Gospel writer, in this first section of the first chapter, goes back and forth talking about Jesus there, verses 1 through 5, and then John, the immerser, from verses 6 through to verse 8, and then after putting the spotlight on Jesus again in verses 9 through 14, where we've been these last many weeks, briefly turns to this, another sidebar on John, the forerunner to Jesus, here in verse 15. What the Gospel writer records John doing here is exactly what we had already been told from the earlier part in this chapter, verses 6 through 8, what he was sent from God to do. John testifies. That's what he does. And it's Jesus of whom he said, one who comes after him has surpassed him because he was before him. That's John's testimony. Part of John's testimony. Some of John's considerable testimony about Jesus. Not only does Jesus have a date of birth, as we talked about last time, that's after John's, but more significantly here, his ministry comes after John's. That is what John is referring to. And yet the reason that John said Jesus has surpassed him is rooted in those opening verses, 1 through 4 primarily. And later we'll hear in Jesus' own words in chapter 8, before Abraham was born, and if that applies to the great patriarch Abraham, well then most certainly also applies to Jesus' own relative, John the Immerser, that long before either of them or anyone else was born, I am. Jesus is God. And John was to bear witness to that and testify about Him. And as we said when we looked at verses uh, 6 through 8 a number of weeks ago, and again last week in verse 15, we reminded ourselves once more that that is what we are to be doing today, that we as Jesus' ambassadors now and Jesus' disciples today are to be following John's example here and sharing our testimony about Jesus and bearing witness to Him. There's so much to learn from John and we won't get into any more about Him now as we move on into verses 16 through uh, to 18 tonight and perhaps following. But there's so much to learn from John as, as we seek to bear witness to Jesus, as we try to do that in our lives from day to day, just one of those things we've already seen here, and we'll see even more so, each time that the Gospel writer John turns his attention to John the Immerser, is that his testimony was never about himself. We'll see that in verses 19 and following. It's never about him. He kept the spotlight on Jesus. And any time there was any temptation to remove that spotlight from Jesus and put it on himself and bask in the limelight, take that glow and that shine and the glory, John turned it down flat in an instant. Never was drawn into that or by that temptation. But always kept the spotlight on Jesus. And every time we see John serves as a reminder to us to ask ourselves the question, what kind of witness are we? We see the kind of witness John bore. We see his testimony about Jesus, the Messiah. But what kind of witness are we to who Jesus is in our lives? We know the confession that we've made. We believe Him to be Lord and Christ that He is. Jesus, the Messiah, the light of the world, the Word who is God. But what is our testimony about Him outside of these walls? Outside of this place, outside of our homes? And John reminds us that we need to be cognizant of that, reflective when it's reflecting on on that, and the kind of witness that we would bear to Jesus in our lives. So moving on in in 16 on through 18 for now, uh, what else does John the gospel writer in this instance, have to say to us about who Jesus is. Not the testimony of John the Immerser, but now back to the gospel writer John, and what 
else does he have to say to us in this section about who Jesus is? Grace and truth, verse 17, comes through him. We saw that in 14. He came from the Father full of grace and truth. Grace and truth come through him. Yes? Uh, you know, he also goes on to say that you know, he, is, he is God and, and no one has seen God, but yet so the people that did get to see him are able to see and know who God is because of seeing him. And we're able to know through his right. Yeah, isn't that an amazing thought? That, that no one has seen God, but those who see Jesus have seen God the one and only. They've seen him in the person of Jesus. And so through their eyewitness account, we get to see God also. Not in the same way as, as those that sat by the, the Sea of Galilee and ate, ate fish with the God-man. But through this record, through their testimony, we, through faith, see Him, Jesus. And every time we look at Jesus, we see God. That's an important aspect of this first 18 verses of this chapter 1. No question about it. Jesus shows us God, shows us the grace and truth of God, shows us that all this comes from verse 16, the fullness of His grace. Other thoughts here about what John has to say to us about who Jesus is. Yeah, isn't that quite a statement that's made there? Boy, we could miss that, just the, the, the very last part of verse 16. That's what He's doing for us. That's what He's done and is doing for us. We receive. We're the recipients here of one blessing after another. Boy, this reveals so much to us about this loving, compassionate, benevolent, gracious, merciful, kind God who is at the same time all power, all authority, righteousness, holiness, doesn't have to be full of grace and truth, but He is. Could be like we kind of get sometimes out of, out of whack with that unequal measure, but His grace and His truth. And even knowing the truth about us as sinners, He still pours out one blessing after another in His goodness to us. Bill? Mm -hmm. You know, with uh, how superior the gospel of Christ is to, the, to what the law of Moses was. Yeah, absolutely. That's another great point in this text. And I hear that word superior, and you probably, I think of my father in law because of how much he loves uh, Hebrews. And going through that book, you see how much more uh, the superiority of this new covenant, superiority of Christ, our great high priest. And that while one is good, <laughs> there's, there's no comparison. It's a, it's a true contrast. This, this, this second eclipses it completely. Jesus has come to fulfill it. And grace and truth come through Jesus. There's no surprise here then in verse 16 that the one who came from the Father, according to verse 14, full of both grace and truth, has been blessing us, as Mike observed from the last part of verse 16, with one blessing after another. You, you get the sense of that? On and on and on. One blessing. He could, he could just kept going and it, his pen could have kept moving. With one blessing after another, after another, after another. How many times did he need to write after another, after another, after another before, before we say, yeah, continuously. One blessing after another. And all of those blessings from what? From the fullness of his grace. Well, that's a powerful Description, a powerful picture from the fullness of the grace of God. He pours out this unending supply of one blessing after another, after another. And He fills us up until we are what? Running over and His blessings are now pouring out of us. 
and should be blessing those in closest proximity to us first, those that we live with, our, our children, our parents, our spouses, our siblings, our families, our friends, our co-workers, our neighbors, those in our, our circles that we move in, those within His family here, our brothers and sisters in the body of Christ, and then they just continue to flow over and pour out into the lives of other people farther and that, that ripple effect it just moves out and His blessings are seen and His blessings are felt and that's how as we were in our uh, time there in Colossians on Sunday mornings in Colossians 1 I think it's verse 27 Christ in you the hope of glory I see Him living in us it's Jesus who is fully God who has been pouring out into our lives, blessing upon blessing throughout time, out of the fullness of His grace, which is full to overflowing, so that receiving one grace after another, our cup is full and it's running over with all of the blessings that He is and has been and will continue to be. We can trust in that, can't we? We know that. Because we've been the recipients of these blessings in the past, we're currently receiving them even now, and He's going to continue to give us those blessings in our lives. Jesus is, as one of the hymns, I know Mike likes this hymn in the, in the 900 section of our books, uh, of our songbook, our all in all. He's our everything. He is everything that we ever need. Another song, maybe if you're not a fan of the 900 section, Jesus is what? All the world to me. I want no better friend. He is everything to us. Our all in all. Another song that we sometimes sing, we sing, count your blessings, don't we? Well, how long would we be here if we took an evening like this? Or, or maybe we would need to set aside a, a whole day, gather for breakfast and start to list those blessings. How long would we be were we to try to do that? We need a long, 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 long time. And that would be, just to articulate, I think a fraction of the blessings that we have all received. And safe to say, many of the things that would come to our minds first, it may take us a long time, maybe hours before we're stretched beyond those physical blessings that we have to be thankful for, that we have received out of the fullness of His grace, the things that we need in uh, and of this life. And even then, we'd probably miss out a great many of those. Uh, maybe different ones of us would come up with different things and we'd cover a lot of those bases, but we'd still miss out many. Perhaps we're not even truly aware of all of the blessings that He gives us. To say nothing of the statement that we find over in Ephesians 1 and verse 3, uh, just keep your, your finger, if you would, in John chapter 1. We won't be in Ephesians long, but I can think of no other Scripture this concise that says it all quite so directly and powerfully and yet succinctly. Ephesians 1.3. I get this one mixed up sometimes with 1 Corinthians 3. I think I referenced it that way a few weeks ago. Uh, Ephesians 1 and verse 3. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly, in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. With every spiritual blessing in Christ. You know, we might go a long ways enumerating our blessings, counting our blessings, articulating those physical blessings that we receive. And in keeping with one of the themes that arose last time in John, that we see this contrast between the physical and the spiritual, or as oftentimes we talk about it moving through John's gospel, that earthly plane and the heavenly plane, we've been blessed, we're told, in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing. In Christ. What does that leave out? Nothing. We have every blessing. And if we're at risk of missing out, 
as we count our blessings on some of those earthly, physical, mental, or emotional blessings, or two that we might not think to write down or, or share out loud, how many would I leave out in trying to enumerate spiritual blessings? How many of those would I fail to come up with if we're trying to count our blessings? Certainly more than we can number. Because there's no way for our minds to fathom or understand the scope or the totality of the spiritual blessings that Jesus is blessing us with. I suggest that He's blessing us in ways that we're not even aware of. That we can't even fully fathom. Such is the fullness of of His grace to us in the blessings He pours out one after another, after another. They're countless, like the stars in the sky or the sand on the shores. Because He's giving us every spiritual blessing in Christ. Brings us back to where we were a couple of Sunday mornings ago and... and here two weeks ago on Wednesday night, in light of what He's done for us, as we come face to face with that once more, what are we doing for Him? When this is, so how, when this is how abundantly good He is to me, when He pours out these blessings upon us, what are we doing in return? When we know what it is Jesus is calling us to do, how committed are we to Him? Those are the questions that cross my mind when I'm reminded again and again of His grace to me, the spiritual blessings that He pours out. So back to this idea of grace and truth now, as, as we saw a moment ago from, from what Mike mentioned there in verse 17, what's the comparison that he makes here regards grace and truth? I think maybe Bill said it better. My, my notes say comparison, but... A few moments ago, he said contrast. That certainly is. This grace and truth, what's the contrast here? Beats the law by a long shot. Beats law by a long shot. Oh, I like the way you're saying that, Mike. It beats law by a long shot. All right, there's the, there's the contrast. Which, which do you want? That's what the Galatian letter's all about. You got those who have come out of Judaism into new life in Christ. And, and they're trying to grasp a hold and go back to vestiges of, of their heritage, of their religion. And we got one letter of our New Testament that almost exclusively is addressing that. Are you crazy? Is what Paul is saying. You want that? Have you lost your minds? You foolish Galatians, he says to them early on in that letter. You don't want to go back to the law. This is greater. This is better. Superior. Supersede. Supersedes it in every way. Moses, we know, was revered by the Jews at this time as they look back to his time before them that Moses was held in high regard, revered, while Elijah was the one in their mind, was the, um, the embodiment of all that the prophets meant. We're going to see that name Elijah here in just a few verses in verse 21. How are you Elijah? He's the embodiment in the Jewish mind of that day of all the prophets. But it's Moses who's the embodiment of of the law. We see that at the transfiguration, don't we? Jesus is flanked by Moses and Elijah, the law and the prophets. Moses was the embodiment of God's law. He was the law bringer or the, the one through whom the law was delivered. The law came through Moses, but the law could never save them and neither can we ever be saved by the law. So what Jesus brought to light was so much more and far, far superior to anything else that came to them before. Now you think about what God had delivered to His people and, and you talk about what He delivered to them. He delivered the law to His people. 
He delivered to them prophets who came with messages for their highest good, but he also delivered them time after time after time. And in the sending of Jesus, and in the ministry of Jesus, and the fulfillment and completion of that mission, so far superior to anything that God had revealed, or sent, or given, or delivered before. And it's still so much greater today for us than anything else we have or could ever receive. The law came through Moses. The law by which we're all condemned as sinners. That's what the law does. It identifies my wrongdoing. It tells us what sin is. Convicts us of guilt and leaves us with nothing before us but condemnation. That's what the law does. It came through Moses condemns us as sinners, but through Jesus Christ comes grace and truth. Grace and truth come through Jesus. The law through Moses. Grace and truth through Jesus. Praise God. Bill. Yeah, through, through the new covenant, I mean, the step, you know, our status, their status, and privileges are, are so far beyond. I mean, you know, we are... Brought into God's family you know, as children, and then you know in the Old, in the Old Testament under the law, you know the, the priests were the ones constantly intervening for people. <coughs> you know, Excuse once, me. Even once a year, I think right. the, the high priest could go into the holy of holies. We can go in there ourselves anytime. Yeah, yeah, uh, <laughs> wherever we are whoever we're with, or all alone, or as we've done collectively tonight, once already, boldly go into, as Bill says, the Holy of Holies, that that intimate relationship with God, the closeness to His presence, when the barrier that stood between us was our sin. And Jesus came and paid the price for that. And tore that temple curtain in two. And made the way of access by which when the Hebrew writer tells us we can come with confidence, come with boldness. Well, that better never be because I'm sticking my chest out saying, look at me. (laughs) Oh, oh. that's because of him. It's because he's invited even me, even you in. Such is his grace. And didn't compromise the truth. The cross I've, I've heard before, and maybe you have too in, in lessons on that subject, is where God's justice and God's mercy meet. God's righteous demand for justice is met because Jesus takes my sin, yours, the sin of everyone who ever lived, upon His shoulders and dies on the cross. But through that, God's justice and mercy meet because now flows His mercy, forgiveness, and grace. Such is His love for us. Wow, no comparison, right? The contrast couldn't be more stark for the law that came through and was given through Moses, the grace and truth that came through Jesus Christ. Excuse me. With Jesus, there's no compromise of the truth. But that truth is, as we hear elsewhere in Ephesians 4, I believe, is in love, right? In all things, speaking the truth in love, we will, speaking the truth in love, we will in all things grow up into Him who is our head. I think verse 14 probably there, Ephesians 4. We in Ephesians, I don't double check that one. That's truth in love. No compromise of truth, as we'll see once more, and is always with grace. A grace that can now save us. The importance of these statements cannot be overemphasized. We 
can't try to hold up truth or hold on to truth without grace any more than those in the first century as we talked about moments ago in Galatians. The Galatian letter gives us uh, teaching on this. Any more than those there in the first century were going to be drawn back to the law. That could never save them. We cannot be saved by what we do. By trying to meet the righteous requirements of the law. We hold the truth, yes, but the truth that we hold up is that we are all only and ever, now and for always and evermore, saved by grace through faith. And that grace is from Jesus. He's the one through whom grace comes. And he clearly states this for us in his word, through the pen of Paul. And again, we're over in Ephesians to see this, chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, and the bell will probably ring before we read it, but we'll pick up. We'll read, we'll read a part of it, but we'll, read, we'll start here next week and, and just read for context more of this section of Ephesians 2. Instead, speaking the truth and love, incidentally, is in 415, not 414. We will all, in all things grow up into uh, Him who is the head. But in Ephesians chapter 2, and I plan to start before this, but since that's our second bell, just consider this thought as we, as we conclude tonight. For it is by grace you have been saved, through faith, and this not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Let's pray. <sighs> Almighty, all merciful, all loving all righteous, all holy, all gracious God. We are not worthy. How could we dare but come into your presence uninvited? How could we come without you extending your arms of love towards us and beckoning us to you and telling us to come with confidence because we're clothed in the righteousness of your Son. Because through your Son, you revealed your grace and truth. And Father, we are more grateful than we can express. As we sing in the hymn, Oh, what a standing is mine. Truly, Father, we do not deserve this standing that you have given you have granted. But it's all because of you and who you are and your love for us that this standing as we sing is mine. Father, we are grateful now and will be eternally grateful because we were lost and without hope. We stood condemned to eternal separation from you in a place of unthinkable pain and suffering. And yet through Jesus, our Savior, and the gift of Your grace, we can have eternal life. Father, we thank You and we praise You and we love You. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The program for me to pull that song up on the slide would, would take several minutes to load, uh, but let's sing 226 if you've got a, I'm guessing you'll know it, and if not, you should have a hymn book within reach. But let's sing this one on the recording. Prayer to the Lord for the blood. 
Okay. 226. How great thou art. And bud, as you're watching this, Guy, we love you and we're praying for you. Oh Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds thy hands have made, I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe displayed. Then sings my soul. My Savior God to Thee, how great Thou art, how great Thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to Thee, how great Thou art, how great Thou art. When through the woods and forest glades I wander and hear the birds sing sweetly in the trees. When I look down from lofty mountain grandeur and hear the brook and feel the gentle then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art, how Son not sparing, send him to die. I scarce can take it in that on the cross my burden gladly bearing, he bled and died to take away my sin. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art. How great Thou art! When Christ shall come with shout of acclamation and take me home, what joy shall fill my heart? Then I shall bow in humble adoration and there proclaim my God how great thou art then sings my soul my Savior God to thee how great thou art how great thou art and sings my 